So here's an influential article that I read very early on on, on feminist psychology, which is there's a paper by um, Martha Mednick in the late 80s mm -hmm. called Stop, Stop the Bad the and Write and I Want to Get Off or some help. And it's, it's her take on this um, debate that was going on about the gender similarity and gender difference. The paper she originally read in Dublin, Ireland, which is oh. just more of a coincidence <laughs> than anything else, but I first read it in Dublin, Ireland as well. Um, and uh, we, we actually took a course in psychology of women and gender in Ireland, in the, which was taught by Sheila Green and Peggy Fine Davis, and that was on the books when I was there. And uh, this was one of the first things that Sheila Green suggested to us in that class. Um, and in the paper, Mednick is, is sort of makes an argument against different feminism, things like Carol Gilligan's work, to sort of say, look, this is sort of presenting this image, which is going to, you know, just, 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 just justify sexism again. Um, and I, that, that really sparked my interest. I got very interested in that question um, and sort of stayed interested in those questions about difference and so on. So when I got to the States and I started to read some of the stuff that was um, the gender and science stuff, you know, the kind of stuff that sort of summarised maybe in Sandra Harding's book, The Science Question in Feminism, um, I began to see that as very disconnected from what was going on in psychology, uh, but, but very relevant. Um, I mean, there was people like... Um, Jean Marichek and Rachel Hermoston, who were, who were bringing some of that stuff across. Um, but psychology had gotten, I thought, very polarised between this sort of, you are a radical, marginal, social constructionist who thinks science is bad, men's knowledge, and therefore could never run an experiment, or you have absolutely lock, stock and barrel signed up to this idea that science is an absolutely neutral, laissez-faire, free marketplace of ideas where truth outs with no social mediation whatsoever. I mean, I'm, I'm stereotyping a little bit, but that was the kind of debate that was sort of getting staged in venues like feminism and psychology or even American psychologists in, in the 90s. Um, and I, I wanted to do, so, so my idea um, with, with that I sort of developed with, with Philly Chapato was to sort of take that and sort of say, well, look, can we look at how people look at, think about differences, think about similarities and think about the kinds of empirical differences and similarities Mm -hmm. um, that psychology routinely produces and think about those as, uh, we do experiments about that, right? Um, maybe we could just mash this up a bit. <laughs> um, so that was, that was where we started. We did a number of experiments that didn't work terribly well. Um, and then I, I had, in John Fujimura's class, I had read Judith Butler's Bodies That Matter. Um, and in Body, which, I, which I read before I read Gender Trouble, which was probably an unusual thing to do, but not to worry. Um, <laughs> and in, in Bodies That Matter, Butler, in the, particularly in the first chapter, she sort of argues, she makes this defense of her earlier position about discourse, uh, which is this idea that there are these kind of, um, there's this heterosexual matrix, which is a implicit discursive framework, which sort of organizes thinking about gender uh, and gender differences. Um, and that this is sort of made up by being cited uh, in discourses, but this, these chains of citationality are, are invisible and they're not, they're not explicit and so on. So that was an idea, I thought, when I read that, I thought, this is very interesting. This is, this is a way of thinking about language that has purchased. I'm not sure mm -hmm. where this is going. Um, and then quite, I can't even remember why I read it, how I came across it, but I came across that article by Dale Miller and his colleagues on how people explain gender differences, and I thought this is very interesting. Um, and I could really see the connection between what Butler was saying about these kind of um, implicit forms of normativity, uh, which shape the way we think about difference, and then what people were sort of saying in cognitive psychology around this norm theory that, mm -hmm. that Miller had worked out with Kahneman sometime earlier. Um, so I thought, oh, this, now this is really what I want to do, actually. Here's something, this is very, very obscure, but this is a really point of similarity, actually, between what Butler is doing and what somebody like Daniel Kahneman is doing, right? Okay. Um, and and it's, it's really quite there. I mean, if you read the Kahneman and Miller's paper on norm theory from the late 80s, they're saying, you know, there are these implicit representations that represent normativity. They're in working memory. They're constructed moment to moment. Um, they're made up, they can change, but they often don't because of incumbent things. It's very, very similar to the way Butler is talking about discursive formations, albeit within a kind of computational framework rather than within a discursive one. Um, so instead of sort of 
polarizing that debate into, you know, there are scientists and there are social constructionists, I decided not to bother, not to worry about that epistemology too much. Um, and to just crack on and do some experiments, and that's what we did around that. And so, um, we've done a lot of experiments <laughs> with people explain group differences. Um, and more recently, uh, Susan Bruchmuller has done some very nice work about what the consequences of those asymmetric explanations are uh, for the way people feel about others, the way they stereotype others, and, and more recently, she's done some work on how it makes people feel about themselves. Right. Um, so, so, so yeah, so, so through that, I think, that was sort of where feminism came in. Mm -hmm. um,